Well, good morning. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Um, I've been tasked like the rest of the guys to preach for 40 minutes. And like Paul, I would say, um, I agree the commandment is good. Uh, but that which I want to do, I uh, don't do. And, uh, so I ask that you would have grace on me uh, to B's quote. I'm not an angel, but I look... Uh, and all of you look like <laughs> angels. Hope a little flattery will buy me a few extra minutes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and we pray um, that you would make us what we're not, but what we want to be, Father. I pray that we would take a fresh drink of the peace that you provide today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, prayer is power. Prayer is power. There's at least three different responses to that, and because we're complex people, I think there's at least, we sometimes can have those three different responses inside of us. As we hear that term, prayer is power, I think the first response that we can have, and it's football season, is we can throw the red flag on the field and challenge it and say, I don't really believe that prayer is power. We may not say it out loud, but functionally we say, I don't believe that it's power. We find ourselves too busy to pray. We feel like it really doesn't work. It's not even the last resort. We see it all the time when a tragedy takes place and People will post online thoughts and prayers, and somebody will come up and say they need more than just prayers. To them, prayer isn't power. That's the first response. You may not challenge it. Uh, you may just be a little conflicted. It may be a cliche to you. You may say, I know it. I believe it. I would say it. Uh, but that's what cliches are, right? They're things that we can relay but they're things that we don't rely on. Here's four reasons why you may be conflicted or why may, you may not feel like prayer is power. First, you may just be too busy, like Martha, too busy providing for your sp physical, spiritual, and emotional well need. You may be too burdened. You may just be in a season of life where all the wind has been knocked out of you and you just can't muster the strength to get up and pray. You may be too bitter. God may have taken something from you that makes you so angry at him that you can't think of getting up and asking him for anything. Or you may be too blessed. God has been too good to you without you having to ask him for a thing. And your full stomach has caused more than indigestion. It's caused a hardened heart. The third response is that this, you may be here and you may be convinced, confident that prayer is power and so you seek to do it and you seek to do it a lot and that's why you're here because you know that it's power and you wanted to come here and leave out here doing it more but what I want to spend my time on here is to say to be convinced that prayer is power doesn't mean that you'll have access to the power that prayer provides. Being convinced is only half of it. You don't just have to be convinced. There's a competence that we have to have to do it the right way that the right thing done in the wrong way can be a wrong thing. Medicine doesn't heal anybody. Rightly administered medicine does. Disinfectant is good for cleaning the table that you're going to eat off of. It's harmful if it's a topping on your food. As Jesus instructs us on prayer in Matthew chapter 6, I don't even think he's instructing a group of people that aren't convinced that prayer is power. This is not a group of folks that aren't praying. 
He's saying, I think that you're praying the wrong way, and there's a hypocrisy that he brings up. You and I are used to thinking of hypocrisy from a moral standpoint. Jay-Z, on his last album, talks about one of the reasons why he hated Christianity was because his grandfather abused his aunt. He acted one way on Sunday, but didn't act that way throughout the rest of the week. And that is a danger, that is a reason why people hate the expression of Christianity that they've seen, but that's not the hypocrisy that Jesus talks about in Matthew 6. It's not the person that prays big on Sunday but doesn't pray through the rest of the week. It's the person that prays the same all the way through the week. They pray a whole lot. They just pray wrongly. And when we have hypocrisy in that way, I think we can lose the power and lead the people in our churches to lose the power that comes from prayer because they think in order to be heard by God, they have to imitate how we pray. He's long, eloquent, all of this stuff. I've got to do all of that stuff to be heard from God. And they don't know, like Christ says here in Matthew 6, Seven, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. What he's saying is your ability to articulate and be eloquent has never been the reason why God has responded favorably to any prayers. Sometimes our eloquence can do a disservice because people imitate that and think that it is in that act that they're heard by God, and so they spend their time working on the wrong things. Or impressive prayers like that can intimidate people and make them not want to pray at all. If that's what it takes to be heard by God, there's no way that I could ever pray like that. Why bother? And they don't tap into this Power And so what Jesus does here throughout Matthew 6, uh, he talks about giving, prayer, fasting, and he talks about the distinct way that Christians, God's people, do it. Everybody else wants to be seen, and he makes this emphasis on secrecy. God sees you, so you don't have to be seen by the rest of them. But here with prayer, he makes his emphasis not just on secrecy, but simplicity. Everybody else makes it this big thing, but look at how plain it is. Look at how easy it is for anybody to be competent. Righteousness is not just about what you do, but how you do what you do. Success in prayer is not just I didn't pray much, and now I came here, and I left, and now me and my church pray more because there's a right way to do the wrong thing. But it's no, no, no. We pray more, and we pray rightly. So here's what I want to do. I want to briefly try my best to explain, not to guilt anybody into prayer, and I pray that this would just lead us into applying Matthew 6. Let's start here in verse 9, and we'll read to 15. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. I want to split this up into two halves. The first point is this, just the aim, the ambition. When it comes to prayer, The aim of prayer, the ambition, the right way to do it, is to seek God's glory more and before God's gifts. 
The aim of prayer is we seek God's glory more and before God's gifts. We seek God's presence more than we do his provision. My daughter's two and a half years old, um, and so she's just starting to learn how to talk and to talk and to talk and to talk and to talk. Uh, One of her favorite words or phrases is me first. So we'll drive home, she'll be in her car seat, um, and before I unbuckle my seatbelt, she'll shout out, uh, Daddy, me first. And I look back at her and those big, beautiful eyes that she uh, has, and I say, no. Me first. What are you going to do if you get out? If you get out first, you're just going to hurt yourself, mess things up, and I'm going to have to come up and clean behind you. No, if you want to experience peace and joy, you have to be reminded that when it comes to this, it's me first. I'm not going to forget about you. In this prayer, one of the things that we can do is follow the pronouns. What you'll find is that all of them are plural, And the first half of the prayer is it talks about the aim or or God. The pronouns are second person plural. So it's not me first, it's he first. It starts off with our Father. As we come, we're embracing not just God, the relationship that we have with him, we're embracing the relationships that we have with others. He is our Father, we are his family. So when you come to pray, um, think of any other pronoun that rhymes with me, and that comes first. He first, we first, if you want to go old school, the first, anything that rhymes with me comes first. To the extent we embrace that, I think we're on the right path to finding peace. Look here, those first four words. Therefore, you should pray like this, our Father in Heaven, like I said, when we come to pray, we have to remember that prayer and the power that comes from it, it comes from embracing relationships, not a regimen. It's not an incantation. It's not words that we say to get things from God. It's embracing this relationship of God as a father, which means that we as his kids, we haven't earned our place into his family. God didn't look at anybody's LinkedIn and said, I think that's a good one. I'm going to snatch them up. No resume. God doesn't have stepchildren. As a father, God loves. God covers faults. God cares. He's concerned. He's patient. One of the great joys I had was 10 years ago, I moved to Atlanta to help start a church. I was 25 years old, getting ready to pastor, and two of the men that I pastored with Uh, had sons that had autism. And do you know what that did for me? It solidified and crystallized this concept of God as Father in a way that no sermon has. That I saw them in the way they doted over their sons who got a diagnosis that they would likely forever be dependent on their fathers. They weren't going to be the stars of football teams. They weren't going to be chosen. They weren't going to be selected. They weren't going to be propped up for the rest of their lives. They would be dependent, and these fathers loved them. And so as Jesus talks about prayer, he starts off that we we have to embrace this. J.I. Packer says it like this, if you really want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of God being his father and he being God's child. If this thought doesn't prompt and control his worship, prayer, and whole outlook on life, he doesn't understand Christianity very well. Everything that makes Christianity distinct is summed up in the knowledge of God as father. Father is the Christian name for God. My daughter talks and talks and talks and talks and talks. At church, people call me John, Pastor John, John O. Sometimes we'll get into the car and she'll repeat what she says and I have to turn around and remind her and say, no, 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 everybody else calls me that, but you call me Father. 
there's a different way that I want you to relate to me than anybody else. And as Jesus starts off this prayer, what he's saying is that you and I have to embrace him. He's a good father. That when we mess up, it's not, I've messed up, my dad's going to kill me. It's, we've messed up, I really need to call my dad. That's the picture, the invitation that he gives here. And I'll just say it right now. I don't know how long it's been since you've actually cried out to your father, but it's something that you can do right now if you are a believer in Christ. I give you permission to check out for a bit. I'm going to repeat myself a lot so you'll catch up. You can do that in your seat right now. What I love is that even in private, We're to pray with other people in mind. We're not to pray to impress people, but even our prayers in private, in the closet, are meant to be plural, praying to our Father. We don't just embrace this relationship that we have with God. We embrace the right posture, and the words go on, our Father in heaven. Psalm 115.3 says God sits in the heavens and does what he pleases. Heaven is not just a location. It's meant to define a position of power, right? So if somebody's in the White House, they don't just reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. What we're saying is they have power and authority. And at the outset of this prayer, Jesus is saying the most powerful being in the universe is inclined to hear the words that come from your mouth. And if you knew that you had the ear of God, what would you ask for? What would you pray for? What are the particulars? Surely there's something that's weighing on your mind right now that would get priority. Here's what I love about Jesus. He prescribes everybody the same thing. He gives this cookie cutter. No, no, I know there's lots of things on your mind, but this is what you want. My brother passed away four years ago, um, and there is a lot that I've missed about him through the years. Um, One of the things, right, as time goes on, you start to realize the trivial things that you miss. One of the things that I miss uh, is that when I had to get fitted for a wedding, He was the responsible brother. I was the one that procrastinated. We were exactly the same size. So he would go and get fitted, and whatever was cut out for him, I say, just send it over for me. I'll take the same thing. Listen, as Jesus is looking at a group of folks with all types of concerns, he says, no, no, listen, just take the same thing. The measurements that I'm going to lay out, here's what you need. Take that. And what it starts with is not our grievances or what we need, but as we pray, it begins with God's glory, and that's something that unifies us because we all think we need different things, but Jesus is saying, no, 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 everybody needs the same thing. Look here at verse uh, 9 and 10. Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Follow the pronouns. What he's saying is, God, what we want is for your presence to be seen here on the earth. Your name be honored as holy. God, we want to live in a place here on earth where as you walk in through the back door, we all do what we do at weddings, and we rise for the bride. Because we know even the groom included, that that day is not about you. It's about her. God's saying, me first. And as we pray, we want to be reminded. God, we want your name to be honored as holy. Your kingdom to come. We want your kingdom, the way that you do things, the way that you function, the way that you rule, to be established here on earth as it is in heaven. We want your purposes to advance. What what Jesus is saying here is we want God's presence here. If God is our Father, we don't just want child support. We want him present 
and around and here and close. What I love about this is this isn't just a directive. It's a diagnostic. I have a friend that says, John, life is overwhelming. Uh, Make sure you're overwhelmed by all the right things. The question is, how often do you find yourself burdened by these things? How often does God's name not being honored in the world cause you to not want to eat or sleep because you're so weighed down? How often does God's kingdom not being seen here on the earth as it should cause you to just get into a place where you're just burdened and weighed down? How often does it make you angry and even depressed that these things haven't come to pass? Or do you read these things, hear these things, and know that you should, um, and you find yourself trying to muster up that emotion? Have you ever tried to be fake mad at something? My um, wife loves to watch these shows that I do not care about at all. So American Idol, The Voice, and in an attempt to bond, one of the things that I do is when she gets mad that her person didn't get picked, I try to get mad. And I sit there and I'm like, ugh, I can't believe it, right? When you try to be fake mad, you use these words that you don't use, like, I'm aghast, I'm I'm chartreuse, right? And you just say these things. But do you know what takes place? The show's done, and she's stewing in it for days. And I get up, and I walk away, and I don't think about it. I go about my business. And in that we see that it's not God's absence in the world that causes the world that we live in to to be like this. It's actually the apathy in our hearts to God's reign in the world that causes the world to be like what it is. So these things, this is what's really wrong with the world that we live in. So the mass shooter that killed five people in Odessa, injured 21. Do you know what was at the root of of that? God's name wasn't honored as holy. He blurred the distinction in between the creature and creator and saw himself as somebody that had the right to determine who lives or who dies. The racial conflict that exists, what's that other than people not realizing that the way that you treat people shows what you think of their creator? The poor that are disregarded moved to the periphery of the cities that we lived in, pushed out. What's that other than some people not liking the way that God teaches us we should treat the poor in his kingdom, and we would much rather have them on the periphery to exploit them instead of caring for them? Do you see how... The problems that go on in the world are not foreign to the thing that Jesus prescribes us to continually pray about. Instead of being fake mad, do you know what we can do? Follow our real emotions, because they are arrows that point to what we really value and love. How often Do you find yourselves angry that your name isn't honored as holy? How easy it is to feel disrespected by your boss, by your kids, by strangers, by a waiter? How often do you find yourself losing sleep because your kingdom isn't coming like you hoped that it would? When do you find yourself the most bitter with God? Is it when your will isn't done on earth as you think that it should be? When you pray, what are the things that make your prayer lists? 
Is it ever the former, what we see here, or is it always the latter? I want you to hear this. We have to get out of the realm of thinking that good and bad prayers lie along the uh, lines of morality and immorality. We have to think in terms of glory. It's not if it's a good or bad prayer if I'm praying for good things or bad things, but if you think in terms of glory, it's a good or bad prayer, and the right grid is, am I praying for God's glory or my own? You may say, well, John, if I'm honest, I don't want these things above all else. I want my own honor, kingdom, and purpose. And I would say, that's the source of your anxiety and trouble. And two, that's why Jesus prescribes to us this prayer. Look at the freedom that comes from praying this way, that if we truly want God's honor, kingdom, and glory, his purpose to shine, above all else. Do you know what that does? Do you know how it transforms us? When your honor is disrespected, like it will be this week. You may be disappointed, but you're not devastated. When your kingdom doesn't work out, when your will doesn't work out like you hoped that it would, like it does for everything that you put your trust in in this life. You won't be ruined. You find out that when you pray, Lord, not my will but yours be done, I want your will to come. What's packaged in that prayer is, God, I want your will so bad that even when you do things that are confusing, that I don't like, when trouble comes on me, God, I still want your will. And throughout the Bible, there's a lot of people that have prayed a derivative prayer of that, God, your will be done. Job, you remember that guy? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His will is going to be done here. The Hebrew boys thrown into the fire, and they say, hey, our God can save us. But even if he doesn't, we're still going to worship him. And I believe that they were trusting God to save them, and they got closer and closer to that fire, and they said, God, any time now. And then they got thrown in the fire, and do you know what God did in the fire? Showed his sufficiency in a way that he couldn't if he just prohibited them from trouble. He persevered them in and through trouble. And then Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, prays the same prayer. God, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And God one-ups that. He doesn't just persevere through trouble. Jesus goes all the way to death. The sentence of death was on him, but he served the God that was a divine editor who can change the period that lies at the end of death into a comma and say, let's continue this story. That's what God does. Hear the words of Richard Baxter when he he says this, I hope I shall never dare to say or think that he is mistaken or that I could have chosen better for myself. Many a time hath the wise and good will of God crossed my foolish and rebellious will. And afterwards, I have perceived that it was best. It is not an enemy or a tyrant that made me, preserves me, or calls me hence. The more I have tried him, the better I have found him. Had I better obeyed his ruling will, how happy had I been. O foolish, sinful soul, is it not far better to be at God's choice than my own or any man's? Have you ever thrown a surprise party or had somebody throw one for you? And as you're planning, what are you met with with them? Suspicion. Bitterness. I just feel like you're hiding something from me. Frustration. We were supposed to do this and you changed up the plans at the last minute. Suspicion. I look through your phone, and why are you calling and texting all of my friends? Something's wrong. 
and they doubt, and they doubt, and they doubt. Until you walk into that dark room, you turn the lights on, and you yell, surprise, and you see both gratitude and shame on their face, and the shame is a little bit more rewarding. I want you to know, Christian, God is throwing a surprise party for you, as he always has been. And when we pray, all we're doing is recounting the faithfulness of God. We're asking God to do the things that he already wants to do. Do you know what that means? That means this. Christian, you are a better historian than you are a detective. Your hindsight works much better than your insight. There are mysterious things that God is doing that you, this side of eternity, will never know. And you exhibit trust in him and saying, God, I pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't get it, but more than your particular provision, here's what I want. I want your presence. I want your glory. Man, that clock moves quick. <laughs> Point two. Yo, yo, I want you to hear this. Listen, where God's glory is our aim, and Christ's going to say this, we still need his stuff, but we realize that the stuff is not the target. The stuff that he gives is just the ammunition that hits that target and shows God's glory. Where God's glory is the aim, his gifts or the ammunition, we still need his stuff, but the back half of the prayer, you know, like splits. The first part of the prayer is about heaven. The back part is about what we need here on earth. And the long and short of it is, God doesn't just tell us how to pray, but he tells us what to pray for. We're to pray for everything. He wants us to be completely dependent on him for all types of things, right? Present provision, give us the bread that we need for the day. Pardon from sin. Protection, all types of things. Physical, spiritual, relational. But not just at all types, at all times. God, I need bread for today, the day that I'm in present. I need forgiveness for the past. I need protection for the future. Whichever direction I look in, I'm to be reminded of my dependence. I love how David does it in Proverbs 30. I think it's David. I, Proverbs 30, I love that. Where you get this prayer for daily bread, but it's this prayer that's packed into this like knapsack of God's glory. And what he says is, God, don't give me too little, because if I starve, then I'll steal, and that'll say something about your sufficiency. God, but don't give me too much, because if I'm full, I'll ignore you. And that says something about your sufficiency. Even in the bread that you give for today, make me dependent on you so that every day I wake up needing what you give me, but every day I'm confident that you'll provide all the things that I need and you will make me dependent and I will be a picture of your faithfulness. He goes on and prays and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Once again, follow the pronoun. They're plural. He wants us to know that as we pray for forgiveness, forgiveness is never found in your performance. It's always found in God's past pardon. It's a gift. It's not a reward. It's not earned. And if we pray for it and know that it's earned, do you know what that does for us? It keeps us from working for God's forgiveness and it keeps us from making somebody else work for the forgiveness that we got for free. God loves to give us good gifts and his good gifts are never for resale. They're meant to be re-gifted. We're not asking for another chance. We're asking for pardon. 
We're not saying, God, let me make this up to you. Because makeup doesn't heal any blemishes. It only hides them. We're saying, God, I need you to restore. I need you to fix. I need you to save. And then he tells us to pray, hear this, for future protection. And I want to camp out here for a bit. We never outgrow our need for deliverance. God is not running a self-defense class where he teaches us how to care for ourselves. He's saying, no, 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 stay close, always stay close, daily, from the strongest to the weakest of you, be reminded that you all need my help. I'm not a fighter. I haven't been in a fight since the, like, sixth grade. Um, in church, when I was in the fourth grade, me and my god brother got into a little bit of a tiff, and we decided that we were going to fight after church. Um, he was bigger than I was, so I thought that I was, yeah, quick with it. So we walk into the bathroom. My brothers were with me, um, and Stephen starts off. He squares up, and before I know it, I get this, like, left jab right in my face, and I'm knocked off, and the last words that I remember saying, not because he knocked me out, but I just said, help. <laughs> and both of my brothers came to my aid and subdued Stephen. And I realized at that point, as long as I have them around, I don't have to learn how to fight. I just have to learn how to call for help. As Jesus is teaching his church to be dependent against the enemy of their soul, what he's saying is, look, my brothers are distant. One's with the Lord now. One is hundreds of miles away. But you have a God in Scripture that has promised never to leave you or forsake you. And so he takes care of the weakness that we feel, not by making us strong, but by mitigating the effects of weakness by providing us somebody that we can depend on. Always, at all times, so we always should. This is a prayer here that extends from God at the start to the devil at the end, from heaven to earth. And pastor, church leader, Christian, what I love about it is that this prayer is full of plural pronouns. Even if you pray it on your own, it's meant to be prayed. Prayer is meant to happen with other people in mind. Here's how this practically works out, just a few quick ones. God, give us this day our daily bread. You pray that by yourself and you're grateful for the way that God meets your needs. You pray that in a church with a group of folks and somebody from your church loses their job and you get a promotion, do you know what we do? We all come together and said, God answered the prayer to give us the bread that we need. You don't have what you need. I have more than what I need. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you provide. God, forgive us of our sins. Do you know what that does? It eliminates grudges. Because what we say is, how can I hold this against you when I ask God to give me pardon? God, protect us from the evil one. Keep us holy. That when somebody finds themselves in your business, it's not intrusive. Praying for future protection, and I skipped this, but I really want to get this. It is a great prayer for those of us that may find ourselves here in this room addicted to something, whether that is pornography or pride or an illegal substance. As often as you pray that God would feed you for the day to get up and to be reminded that you have the freedom to live one day at a time. You have the freedom today to pray that God would keep you and give you what you need. This teaches us dependence, not just in what we go to God to get. It reminds us that the things that we get from God are meant to be distributed. They aren't ours. 
All of that is good news only for those that can actually start this prayer echoing the words of Christ, our Father. The problem is, is the Bible talks about our condition. It says that we come into this world not as God's children, but as children of wrath. Because of Adam's first sin and our subsequent sin, heaven and earth have been ripped apart and there's been a barrier set up in the middle. We don't want God's glory. We don't get angry at the things that he does. We want our kingdom and he wants his. So do you know what this good God does? He sends his son into the world. And you look at the life of Christ and what you see is he is burdened by the things that God is burdened by. He's not offended by his honor being slighted. Matthew 9, he looks and he weeps because he sees sheep with no shepherd. So in Mark, do you know what he does? In the triumphal entry, he storms into the city, on a, or, or he comes into the city on a donkey, but he doesn't storm the castle. He goes to the temple. In Luke, he's weeping over this city. In John, he's in the temple turning over tables. And he finds himself with a group of people that are oppressed by a worldly power, and they are awaiting somebody to bring a kingdom like the one that they want and not like the one that God had in mind. So much so that when Jesus tells them what God had in mind, they're disappointed, frustrated, and offended. They want his gifts. We want his gifts, but we don't want his glory. Not his presence. Not his rule. So I just want to walk you through some of the prayers that Jesus prayed in the last week of his life, the thing that all of your gospels devote at least a third of their words to. John chapter 17, verse 1, you talk about one that longs for God's glory. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. In John, that refers to the crucifixion. The time has come for me to submit to your will and to die. For those that you want to make yours, look, glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Jesus' chief concern was God's glory. Mark 14, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. God, I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Luke 23. Right. Jesus is practicing what he preached, but in this case, he can't practice what he preached. He tells us to pray that God would forgive us our sins as we have forgiven others. On the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what to do. He didn't have any sins to ask for forgiveness for. So we just ask that God would forgive them. And then in Matthew 27, 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, your son, that lived this life, longing for your glory more than your graces and your gifts? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then on in verse 50, it says this, but Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And hear this, suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two the representative barrier between God and man, heaven and earth, was completely undone by what Christ has done. So that now for all of us to put our trust in what he's done for us, the words of this prayer, they mean something. We don't just 
parrot them, but they are our paradigm and our pattern and what we use, and we're reminded that we can say these words and mean them. Our Father, we have been adopted into his family. One of the things that I learned about adoption is in the state of Georgia, um, your kids that were born to you, you can write them out of your will. Your adopted children, you can never write them out of your will. Once they are brought in, their position is permanently fixed. What Jesus did on the cross, he, per he has permanently fixed your position. And you have power in being able to access God. His ear is inclined to you. You have this amazing gift. The barrier that your sin erected, his sacrifice has torn down once and for all. And he's provided you and I and our churches with this amazing gift to recalibrate our hearts and to remind ourselves of his goodness daily. Your prayers are about the strength of your relationship, not your regimen. And that relationship has been securely fixed because of Jesus' performance, not yours. You have a gift. Hear this. Use it while you can. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible says that faith, love, and hope are all great, but faith will, faith will pass away one day. We won't need faith because we'll be in the presence of God. Same with hope, but love will endure. Prayer of this sort that he gives us, um, it's not a non-perishable food item, right? You think of those can of green beans that have been in your mom's house that uh, are still good, right? You saw them in the fourth grade and you go back now on the expiration date, it hasn't quite hit. Uh, prayer of this sort is not like that. And here's what I mean by that. There will be a day where we will no longer have to request that God's name be honored as holy because everybody in heaven and earth and under the earth will recognize his honor. There will be a day where we won't have to pray for his kingdom to come. The saints that are crying out in Revelation 6, how long until you vindicate us, Lord, they'll have their answer. His kingdom will be set up on earth perfectly. There will be a time where we won't have to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven because he will have done it. We won't need to pray for our daily bread because he'll be the one that sustains us. We won't need to pray for the forgiveness of sins because the capacity to sin will be forever removed from us. We won't need to pray for future protection because every enemy will be completely, eternally, and finally done away with. And all that we'll have to do is spend an eternity enjoying, praising, we won't have to use our insight anymore. We'll get to use hindsight, and it'll be a joyous thing to be historians. We get to praise God. Until then, we get to watch God work and enjoy it and not spend our time worrying about where provision is going to come from, working for forgiveness or lamenting our weakness. God gives. God provides. And when his glory is the aim, all the gifts that he gives us show the world his glory, his goodness, his kindness. We, church, get to be a part of that. Let's use that gift right now. Let's pray. Our Father, we are 
and we will be eternally grateful. Help us to live as those that are transformed by your goodness. Help us to ever depend on you and to be reminded that it is a gift to depend on somebody who is perfectly dependable. Father, I pray that you would help us to lead our churches to do the same and experience the refreshment that comes from being your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.